25. Back to the Great Depression. To make a long story short, Germany invaded Austria, and then Czechoslovakia, and then Poland, and then France. And I was a pip pipsqueak casualty in faraway New York City. Colomb Frere et C was out of business, so I lost my job at the agency. Not that long after my father's, Mus my father's Muslim obsequies. So I joined what was still a peacetime United States Army, and scored high on their classification test. The Great Depression was as discouraging as ever, and the Army was still a very little family in this country, so I was lucky to be accepted. The recruiting sergeant on Times Square, I remember, had indicated that I might be a more attractive relative in, pros in prospect if I were to have my name legally changed to something more American. I even remember his helpful suggestion that I become Robert King. Just think, somebody might now be trespassing on my private beach and gazing in awe at this mansion, and wondering who could be rich enough to live this well, and the answer could so easily have been this, Robert King. But the army adopted me as Rabo Karabakian, as I was soon to discover for this reason. Major General Daniel Whitehall, then the commander of the combat troops of the Corps of Engineers, wanted an oil painting of himself in full uniform, and believed that somebody with a foreign-sounding name could do the best job. As an army regular, of course, I would have to paint him for free, and this was a man ravenous for immortality. He was going to be retired in six months by reason of failing kidneys, having barely missed service in two world wars. God only knows what became, what became of the portrait I did of him, after hours during basic training. I used the most expensive materials, which he was more than glad to buy for me. Now there is one painting of mine which might actually outlive the Mona Lisa. If I had realized that at the time, I might have given him a puzzling half-smile, whose meaning only I knew for certain. He had become a general, but had missed the two big wars of his lifetime. Another painting of mine, which just might outlive the Mona Lisa, for better or for worse, is the gigantic son of a bitch out in the potato barn. So much I only now realize. When I did the portrait of General Whitehall in a mansion nearly as grand as this one, which was the property of the army, I was stereotypically Ar Armenian. Welcome home to my true nature. I was a scrawny recruit, and he was a pasha, waiting, weighing more than 200 pounds, who could squash me like an insect any time he pleased. But what sly and self-serving advice, but actually very good advice, too, I was able to give him along with flattery on this order. You have a very strong chin. Did you know that? In what must surely have been the manner of powerless Armenian advisers in Turkish courts, I congratulated him on having ideas he might never have had before. An example, You must be thinking very hard how important aerial photography is going to be, if war should come. War, of course, had come to practically everybody but the United States by then. Yes, he said. Would you turn your head to the, le uh, the least little bit to the left, I said. Wonderful. That way there aren't such deep shadows in your eye sockets. I certainly don't want to lose those eyes. And could you imagine now that you're looking from a hilltop at sunset over a valley where a battle is going to take place the next day? So he did that as best he could, and he couldn't talk without ruining everything. But, like a dentist, I was perfectly free to go on jabbering. Good, good, wonderful, perfect, don't move anything, I said. And then I added, almost absent-mindedly as I laid the paint on, Every branch of the, of the service is claiming camouflage from the air as their specialty, even though it's obviously the business of the engineers. And I said a little later, Artists are so naturally good at camouflage, I guess. I'm just, I'm just the first of many to be recruited by the Army Corps of Engineers. Did such a sly and smarmy and levantine seduction work? You be the judge. The painting was unveiled at the general's retirement ceremonies. I had completed my basic training and been promoted to private first class. I was simply another soldier with an obsolescent Springfield rifle, standing in ranks before the bunting-draped scaffold which supported the painting on an easel, and from which the general spoke. 
He lectured on aerial photography and the clear mission of the engineers to teach the other branches of the service about camouflage. He said that among the least among the last orders he would ever give was one which called for all enlisted men with what he called artistic experiences to be assigned to a new camouflage unit under the command of now get this Master Sergeant Rabo Karabakian. I I hope he pronounced his name right. He had he had I was a master sergeant at Fort Belvoir when I read when I read of the deaths of Dan Gregory and Fred Jones in Egypt. There was no mention of Merrily. They had died as civilians, although in uniforms, and they both got respectful obituaries, since the United States was still a neutral nation in the war. The Italians weren't our enemies yet, and the British who killed Gregory and Fred weren't yet our allies. Gregory, I remember, was bid farewell in the papers as possibly the best-known American artist in history. Fred was sent on to Judgment Day as a World War I ace, which he wasn't, and an aviation pioneer. I, of course, wondered what had become of Merrily. She was still young, and I presumed beautiful, and had a good chance of finding some man a lot richer than I was to look after her. I was certainly in no position to make her my own, Military pay was still very low even for a master sergeant. There were no holy grails for sale at the post exchange. When my country finally went to war like everybody else, I was commissioned a lieutenant and served, if not fought, in North Africa and Sicily and England and France. I was forced to fight at at last on the border of Germany and was wounded and captured without having fired a shot. There was this white flash... The war in Europe ended on May 8, 1945. My prison camp had not yet been captured by the Russians. I, with hundreds of other captured officers from Great Britain, from France, from Belgium, from Yugoslavia, from Russia, from Italy, which country had switched sides, from Canada and New Zealand and South Africa and Australia, from everywhere, was marched at root steps out of our prison and into the still-to-be-conquered countryside. Our guards vanished one night, and we awoke the next morning on the rim of a great green valley, on what is now the border between East Germany and Czechoslovakia. There may have been as many as 10,000 people below us. Concentration camp survivors, slave laborers, lunatics released from asylums, and ordinary criminals released from jails and prisons, captured officers and enlisted men from every army which had fought the Germans. What a sight! And, if that weren't enough for a person to see and then marvel about for a lifetime, listen to this. The very last remains of Hitler's armies, their uniforms in tatters, but their killing machines still in working order, were also there. Unforgettable! 26. At the end of my war, my country, where the only person I knew was a Chinese laundryman, paid in full for cosmetic surgery performed on the place where my eye used to be. Was I bitter? No, I was simply blank, which I came to realize was what Fred Jones used to be. Neither one of us had anything to come home to. Who paid for my eye operation at Fort Benjamin Harrison outside Indianapolis? He was a tall, skinny fellow, tough but fair-minded, plain-spoken but shrewd. No, I am not speaking of Santa Claus, whose image in shopping malls at Christmas time nowadays is largely based on a painting Dan Gregory made for Liberty Magazine in 1923. I am speaking of my Uncle Sam. As I've said, I married my nurse at the hospital. As I've said, we had two sons who no longer speak to me. They aren't even Karabakians anymore. They had their last names legally changed to that of their stepfather, whose name was Roy Steele. Terry Kitchen asked me one time why, since I had so few gifts as a husband and father, I had gotten married, and I heard myself say, that's the way the post-war movie goes. That conversation must have taken place about five years after the war. The two of us must have been lying on cots I had bought for the studio space we had rented above Union Square. That loft had become not only Kitchen's workplace, but his home. 
I myself had taken to spending two or three nights a week there, as I found myself less and less beloved in the apartment in the basement apartment three blocks away, where my wife and children lived. What did my wife have to complain about? I had quit my job as a salesman of life insurance for Connecticut General. I was intoxicated most of the time not only by alcohol, but by the creation of huge fields of a single color of sateen Duralux. I had rented a potato barn and made a down payment on a house out here, which was then a wilderness. In the midst of that domestic nightmare, there arrived a registered letter from Italy, a country I had never seen. It asked me to come to Florence, all expenses paid for one, to testify in a lawsuit there about two paintings, a Giotto and a Macchiato, which had been taken by American soldiers from a German general in Paris. They had been turned over to my platoon of art experts to be catalogued and shipped to a warehouse in Le Havre, where they were to be crated and stored. The general had evidently stolen them from a private house while retreating through North Florence. The crating in Le Havre was done by Italian prisoners of war who had done that sort of work in civilian life. One of them evidently found a way to ship both paintings to his wife in Rome, where he kept them hidden, except to show to close friends after the war. The rightful owners were suing to recover them. So I went over there alone, and I got my name in the papers for accounting for the trip the paintings made from Paris to Le Havre. But I had a secret which I have never told anybody before. Once an illustrator, always an illustrator. I couldn't help seeing stories in my own compositions of strips of colored tape applied to vast featureless fields of sateen Duralux. This idea came into my head uninvited, like a nitwit tune for a singing commercial, and would not get out again. Each strip of tape was the soul at the core of some sort of person or lower animal. So whenever I stuck on a piece of tape... The voice of the illustrator in me, who would not die, would say, for example, The orange tape is the soul of an Arctic explorer, separated from his companions, and the white one is the soul of a charging polar bear. This secret fantasy, moreover, infected and continues to infect my way of seeing scenes in real life. If I watch two people talking on a street corner, I see... Not only their flesh and clothes, but narrow, vertical bands of color inside them. Not so much like tape, actually, but more like low-intensity neon tubes. When I got back to my hotel at about noon on my last day in Florence, there was a note for me in my pigeonhole. As far as I knew, I had no friends in all of Italy. The note on expensive paper with a noble crest at the top said this, There can't be all that many rabo Carabacheans in the world. If you're the wrong one, come on over anyway. I'm mad for Armenians. Isn't everybody? You can rub your feet on my carpets and make sparks. Sound like fun? Down with modern art. Wear something green. And it was signed, Merrily, Countess Porto Maggiore, the coal miner's daughter. Wow. 27. I telephoned her at once from the hotel. She asked if I could come to tea in an hour. I said, I sure could. My heart was beating like mad. She was only four blocks away, in a palazzo designed for Innocenzio the Invisible de' Medici by Leon Battista Alberti, in the middle of the 15th century. It was a cruciform structure whose four wings abutted on a domed rotunda 12 meters in diameter, and whose walls were were half embedded 18 Corinthian columns, four and one half meters high. Above the capitals of the columns was a clerestory, a wall pierced with 36 windows. Above this was the dome, on whose underside was an epiphany. God Almighty and Jesus and the Virgin Mary and angels looking down through the clouds, painted by Paolo Uccello. The terrazzo floor, uh, its designer unknown, but almost certainly a Venetian, was was decorated with the backs of peasants planting and harvesting and cooking and baking and making wine and so on. The incomparable Rebo Karabakian is not here demonstrating his connoisseurship nor his Armenian gift for total recall, nor his fluency with the metric system, for that matter. All All the information above comes from a brand new book published by Alfred A. Knopf, 
Incorporated, called Private Art Treasures of Tuscany, with texts and photographs by a South Korean political exile named Kim Bum Suk. According to the preface, it was originally Kim Bum Suk's doctoral thesis for a, do- a degree in the history of architecture from Massachusetts Institute of Technology. He managed to examine and photograph the interiors of many opulent private homes in and, in and around Florence, which few scholars had ever seen, and whose art treasures had never before been photographed by an outsider or noted in any public catalog. Among these hitherto impenetrable private spaces was, hey, presto, a palazzo of Innocenzo the Invisible de Medici, which I myself penetrated 37 years ago. The palazzo and its contents, uninterruptedly private property for five and a half centuries now, remains private property, following the death of my friend Marilee, Contessa Porto Maggiore, who was the person who, according to the book, gave Kim Bum Suk and his camera and his metric measuring instruments the run of the place. Ownership, upon Marilee's death two years ago, passed on to her late husband's nearest male blood relative, a second cousin, an an automobile dealer in Milan. Who sold it at once to an Egyptian man of mystery, believed to be an arms dealer? His name? Hold on to your hats. His name is Leo Mamagonian. Small world! He is the son of Vartan Mamagonian, the man who diverted my parents from Paris to San Ignacio, and who cost me an eye, among other things. How could I ever forgive Vartan Mamagonian? Leo Mamagonian bought all the contents of the Palazzo, too, and so must own Marilee's collection of abstract expressionist paintings, which was the best in Europe and second in the world only to mine. What is it about Armenians that they always do so well? There should be an investigation. How did I come to possess Kim Bum Suk's invaluable doctoral thesis at precisely the moment I must write about my reunion with Marilee in 1950? We have here another coincidence, which superstitious persons would no doubt take seriously. Two days ago, the widow Berman, made vivacious and supernaturally alert by God only knows what post-war pharmaceutical miracles, entered the bookstore in East Hampton and heard, by her own account, one book of hundreds calling out to her. It said that I would like it, so she bought it for me. She had no way of knowing that I was on the brink of writing about Florence. Nobody did. She gave me the book without herself examining its the contents, and so did not know that my old girlfriend's palazzo was therein described. One would soon go mad if one took such coincidences too seriously. One might be led to suspect that there were all sorts of things going on in the universe which he or she did not thoroughly understand. Dr. Kim, or Dr. Bum, or Dr. Sook, Whichever is the family name, if any, has cleared up two questions I had about the rotunda when I myself was privileged to see it. The first puzzle was how the dome was filled with natural light in the daytime. It turns out there were mirrors in the sills of the clerestory windows, and there were still more mirrors on the roofs outside to capture sunbeams and deflect them upwards into the dome. The second puzzle was this. Why were the vast rectangles between the encircling columns at ground level blank? How could any art patron have left them bare? When I saw them, they were painted the palest rose orange, not unlike the sateen Duralux shade yclept Maui Eventide. Dr. Kim, or Dr. Bum, or Dr. Sook, uh, explains that lightly clad pagan gods and goddesses used to cavort in those spaces, and that they were lost forever. They had not been merely concealed under coats of paint. They had been scraped off the walls during the exile of the Medicis from Florence in, uh, from 1494, two years after the discovery of this hemisphere by white people, until 1531. The murals were destroyed by the insistence of the Dominican monk Geralmo Savonarola, who wished to dispel every trace of paganism, which he felt had poisoned the city during the reign of the Medicis. The murals were the work of Giovanni Vitelli, about whom almost nothing else is known, except that he was said to have been born in Pisa. One may assume that he was the rabo Carabacian of his time, and that Christian fundamentalism was his satin duralux. 
Kim Bum Suk, incidentally, was thrown out of his native South Korea for forming a union of university students which demanded improvements in the curricula. Girolamo Savaranola, incidentally, was hanged and burned in the piazza in front of what had been the Palazzo of Vincenzo the Invisible de Medici in 1494. I sure love history. I don't know why Celeste and her friends aren't more interested. I now think of the rotunda of that palazzo, when it still had its pagan as well as its Christian images, as a Renaissance effort to make an atom bomb. It cost a great deal of money and employed many of the best minds of the time, and it compressed into a small space and in bizarre combinations the most powerful forces of the universe as the universe was understood in the 15th century. The universe has certainly come a long way since then. As for Incenso the, Invis- the Invisible, de Medici, according to Kim Bum Suk, he was a banker, which I chose to translate as loan shark and extortionist, or gangster, in the parlance of the present day. He was simultaneously the richest and least public member of his family. No portrait of him was ever made, save for a bust done of him when a child by the sculptor Lorenzo Ghiberti. He himself smashed that bust when he was 15 years old and threw the pieces into the Arno. He attended no parties and gave none when an adult, and never traveled in the city save in a a conveyance which hid him from view. After his palazzo was completed, his most trusted henchmen and even the highest dignitaries, including two of his own cousins who were popes, never saw him save in the rotunda. They were obliged to stand at the edge of it while he alone occupied the middle wearing a shapeless monk's robe and a death's head mask. He drowned while in exile in Venice. This was long before the invention of water wings. When Marilee told me on the telephone to come over to her palazzo right away, the tone of her voice, coupled with her confession that there were no men in her life just then, seemed guarantees to me that in no more than two hours, probably, I would be getting more of the greatest loving I had ever had and not a callow youth this time, but a war hero, a rue, and seasoned cosmopolite. I, in turn, warned her that I had lost an eye in battle, and so would be wearing an eye patch, and that I was married, yes, but that the marriage was on the rocks. I am afraid that I said, too, in making light of my years as a warrior, that I had spent most of my time combing pussy out of my hair. This meant that women had made themselves available to me in great numbers. This odd locution was a variant of of a metaphor which had made a lot more sense. A person who had been shelled a great deal might say that he had been combing tree tree bursts out of his hair. So I arrived at the appointed hour in a twanging state of vanity and concupiscence. I was led by a female servant down a long, straight corridor to the edge of the rotunda. All the Countessa Porta Maggiore's servants were females, even the porters and gardeners. The one who let me in, I remember, struck me as mannish and unfriendly, and then downright military when she told me to stop just inside the rotunda. At the center, clad from neck to floor in the deepest black mourning for her husband, Count Bruno, there stood Merrily. She wasn't wearing a death's head mask, but her face was so pale and in the dim light so close to the color of of her flaxen hair that her head might have been carved from a single piece of ivory. I was aghast. Her voice was imperious and scornful. So, my faithless little Armenian protege, she said, we meet again. 28. "'Thought you were going to get laid again, I'll bet,' she said. Her words echoed whisperingly in the dome, as though they were being discussed up there by the divinities. "'Surprise, surprise,' she said. "'We're not even going to shake hands today.' I wagged my head in unhappy wonderment. "'Why are you so mad at me?' I asked. "'During the Great Depression,' she said, "'I thought you were the one real friend I had in the world. "'And then we made love.' and I never heard from you again. I can't believe this, I said. You told me to go away, for the good of both of us. Have you forgotten that? You must be, you must have been awfully glad to hear me say that, she said. You sure went away. What did you expect me to do, I said. 
to give me some sign, any sign, that you cared how I was, she said. You've had fourteen years to do it, but you never did it. Not one phone call, not one postcard. Now here you are, back like a bad penny. Expecting what? Expecting to get laid again. You mean we could have gone on being lovers? I asked incredulously. Lovers? 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 She mocked me raucously. The echoes of her scorn for lovers sounded like warring blackbirds overhead. There's never been any shortage of lovers for Marilee Kemp, she said. My father loved me so much he beat me every day. The football team at the high school loved me so much they raped me all night after the junior prom. The stage manager at the Ziegfeld Follies loved me so much he told me that I had to be part of his stable of whores or he'd fire me and have somebody throw acid in my face. Dan Gregory loved me so much he threw me down the stairs because I'd, I'd sent you some expensive art materials. He did what? I said. So she told me the true story of how I had become the apprentice of Dan Gregory. I was flabbergasted. But, but he must have liked my pictures, didn't he? I stammered. No, she said. That's one beating I took on account of you, she said. I took another one after we made love, and I never heard from you again. Now let's talk about all the wonderful things you did for me. I never felt so ashamed in my life, I said. All right, I'll tell you what you did for me. You went for happy, silly, beautiful walks with me. Yes, I said, I remember those. You used to rub your feet on the carpets and then give me shocks on my neck when I least expected it, she said. Yes, I said. And we were so naughty sometimes, she said. When we made love, I said. She blew up again. No, 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 you jerk! You jerk! You incomparable jerk! She exclaimed. The Museum of Modern Art! So you lost an eye in the war, she said. So did Fred Jones, I said. So did Lucrezia and Maria, she said. Who are they, she, I said. My cook, she said, and the woman who let you in. Did you win a lot of medals in the war, she said. Actually, I hadn't done too badly. Uh, I had a bronze star with a cluster and a purple heart for my wound, and a presidential citation uh, unit citation, a soldier's medal, a good conduct badge, and a European-African Middle Eastern campaign ribbon, and seven battle stars. I was proudest of my soldier's medal, which is usually awarded to a soldier who has saved the life of another soldier in situations not necessarily related to combat. In 1941, I was giving a course in camouflage techniques to officer candidates at Fort Benning, Georgia. I saw a barracks on fire, and I gave the alarm. And then I went in twice, without regard for my own safety, and carried out two unconscious enlisted men. They were the only two people in there, and nobody was supposed to be in there. They had been drinking and had accidentally started the fire themselves, for which they were given two years at hard labor, plus loss of all pay and dishonorable discharges. About my medals... All I said to Marilee was that I guessed I had received my share. How Terry Kitchen used to envy me for my soldier's medal, incidentally. He had a silver star, and he said a soldier's medal was worth ten of those. Whenever I see a man wearing a medal, said Marilee, I want to cry and hug him and say, Oh, you poor baby, all the terrible things you've been through, just so the woman and children could be safe at home. She said she used to want to go up to Mussolini, who had so many medals that they covered both sides of his tunic right down to his belt, and say to him, After all you've been through, how can there be anything left of you? And then she brought up the unfortunate expression I had used when talking to her on the telephone. Did you say that in the war you were combing pussy out of your hair? I said I was sorry I'd said it, and I was. I never heard that expression before, she said. I had to guess what it meant. Just forget I said it, I said. You want to know what my guess was? I guessed that wherever you went there were 
wherever you went, there were women who would do anything for food or protection for themselves and the children and the old people since the young men were dead or gone anyway, she said. How close was I? Oh my, oh my, oh, oh my, I said. What's the matter, Raybo? she said. You hit the nail on the head, I said. Wasn't very hard to guess, she said. The whole point of war is to put women everywhere in that condition. It's always men against women, with the men only pretending to fight amongst themselves. They can pretend pretty hard sometimes, I said. They know that the ones who pretend the hardest, she said, get their pictures in the paper, in the paper and medals afterwards. Do you have an artificial leg, she said. No, I said. Lucrezia, the woman who let you in, lost a leg along with her eye. I thought maybe you'd lost one, too. No such luck, I said. Well, she said, early one morning she crossed a meadow carrying two precious eggs to a neighbor who had given birth to a baby the night before. She stepped on a mine. I don't know what army was responsible. We do know the sex. Only a male would design and bury a device that ingenious. Before you leave, maybe you can persuade Lucrezia to show you all the medals she won. And then she added, Women are so useless and unimaginative, aren't they? All they ever think of planting in the dirt is the seed of something beautiful or edible. The only missile they can ever think of throwing at anybody is a ball or a bridal bouquet. I said with utmost fatigue, Okay, Merrily, you've certainly made your point. I have never felt worse in my life. I only wish the Arno were deep enough to drown myself in. Can I please return to my hotel? No, she said. I think I've reduced you to the level of self-esteem which men try to force on women. If I have, I would very much like, you to, ha like to have you stay for the tea I promised you. Who knows, we might even become friends again. Twenty-nine. Marilee led me to a small and cozy library, which used to house, she said, her late husband's great collection of male homosexual pornography. I asked her what had become of the books, and she said that she had sold them for a great deal of money, which she had divided among her servants, all women who had been badly hurt one way or another by war. We settled into overstuffed chairs, facing each other across a coffee table. She beamed at me fondly, and then said this, well, 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 my young protege. How goes it? Long time no see. Marriage on the rocks, you say? I'm, I'm sorry I said that, I said. I'm sorry I said anything. I feel like something the cat drug in. We were served tea and little cakes at that point by a woman who had two steel clamps where her hands should have been. Merrily said something to her in Italian, and she laughed. W what did you say to her, I, I asked. I said your marriage was on the rocks, she said. The woman with the clamp said something to her in Italian, and I requested a translation. She said you should marry a man next time, said Merrily. Her husband plunged her hands into boiling water, she said, in order to make her tell him who her lovers had been while he was away at war. They were Germans, and then Americans, by the way, and gangrene set in. Over the fireplace of Merrily's cozy library was the Dan Gregory-style painting I mentioned earlier, a gift to her from the people of Florence, showing her late husband, Count Bruno, refusing a blindfold while facing a firing squad. She said that it hadn't happened exactly that way, but that nothing ever did, so I asked her how it happened that she became the Contessa Porta Maggiore, with the beautiful palazzo and rich farms to the north and so on. When she and Dan Gregory and Fred Jones arrived in Italy, she said, before the United States got into the war, and against Italy and Germany and Japan, they were received as great celebrities. They represented a propaganda victory for Mussolini. America's greatest living artist and one of its greatest aviators and the incomparably beautiful and gifted American actress Marilee Kemp, he called us, said Marilee. He said the three of us had come to take part in the spiritual and physical and economic miracle in Italy, which would become the model for the world for thousands of years to come. 
The propaganda value of the three of them was so great that she was accorded in the press and at social events with the respect a real and famous actress deserved. So suddenly I wasn't a dim-witted floozy anymore, she said. I was a jewel in the crown of the new Roman emperor. Dan and Fred, I must say, found this confusing. They had no choice in public but to treat me more respectfully, and I had fun with that. This country is absolutely crazy about blondes, of course, so that whenever we had to make an entrance, I came first, and they came along behind me as part of my entourage. And it was somehow very easy for me to learn Italian, she said. I was soon better at it than Dan, who'd taken lessons in it back in New York. Fred, of course, never learned Italian at all. Fred and Dan became heroes in Italy after they died fighting more or less for the Italian cause. Merrily's celebrity survived them as a very beautiful and charming reminder of their supreme sacrifice and of the admiration many Americans had, supposedly, for Mussolini. She was still certainly beautiful, by the way, at the time of our reunion, even without makeup and in widow's weeds. She should have been an old lady after all she had been through, but she was only 43. She had a third of a century still to go. And as I say, she would become Europe's largest Sony distributor, among other things. There was life in the old girl yet. The Contessa was surely way ahead of her time, too, in believing that men were not only useless and idiotic, but downright dangerous. That idea wouldn't catch on big in her native country until the last three years of the Vietnam War. After Dan Gregory's death... Her regular escort in Rome was Mussolini's Oxford-educated and unmarried minister of culture, the handsome Bruno, Count Porta Maggiore. He explained to Merrily at once that they could have no physical relationship since he was interested sexually only in men and boys. Such a preference, if acted upon, was a capital offense at the time, but Count Bruno felt perfectly safe no matter how outrageously he might behave. He was confident that Mussolini would protect him, since he was the only member of the old aristocracy who had accepted a high position in his government, and who virtually wallowed in admiration at the upstart dictator's booted feet. He was a perfect ass, said Marilee. She said that people laughed at his cowardice and vanity and effeminacy. He was also, she added, the perfect head of British intelligence in Italy. After Den and Fred were killed, and before the United States got into the war, Marilee was the toast of Rome. She had a wonderful time shopping and dancing, dancing, dancing with the Count, who enjoyed hearing her talk and was always the perfect gentleman. Her wish was his command, and he never threatened her physically, and never demanded that she do this or that until one night when he told her that Mussolini himself had ordered him to marry her. He had many enemies, said Marilee and they had been telling Mussolini that he was a homosexual and a British spy. Mussolini certainly knew he loved men and boys, but didn't even suspect that a man that silly could have the nerve or wit to be a spy. When Mussolini ordered his minister of culture to prove that he wasn't a homosexual by wedding Marilee, he also handed him a document for Marilee to sign. It was designed to placate old aristocrats to whom the idea of an American floozies inheriting ancient, est ancient estates would have been intolerable. It set forth that in the case of the Count's death, Marilee would have his property for life, but without the right to sell it or leave it to anyone else. Upon her death, it was to go to the Count's nearest male relative, who, as I have said, turned out to be an automo automobile de dealer in Milan. The next day, the Japanese, in a surprise attack, sank a major f fraction of the United States warships at Pearl Harbor, leaving this still pacifistic, anti-militaristic country no choice but to declare war on not only Japan, but on Japan's allies, Germany and Italy as well. But even before Pearl Harbor, Merrily told the only man ever to propose marriage to her, and a rich nobleman at that, that no, she would not marry him. She thanked him for happiness such as she had never known before. She said that his proposal and the accompanying document had awakened for her from what could only be a dream, and that it was time for her to return to the United States, where she could try to deal with who and what she really was, even though she didn't have a home there. But then, all excited the next morning about going home, 
Merrily found the spiritual climate of Rome, although the real sun was shining brightly and the real clouds were somewhere else, to be as dark and chilling as, and this is how she described it to me in Florence, rain and sleet at midnight. Merrily listened to the news about Pearl Harbor on the radio that morning. One item was about the approximately 7,000 American citizens living in Italy. The American embassy, which was still operating, still technically at peace with Italy, announced that it was making plans to provide transportation back to the United States for as many as possible, as soon as possible. The Italian government responded that it would do all within its power to facilitate their departure, but that there was surely no reason for a mass exodus, since Italy and the United States had close bonds of both blood and history, which should not be broken in order to satisfy the demands of Jews and communists and the decaying British Empire. Merrilee's personal maid came in with the quotidian announcement that some sort of workman wanted to talk to her about the possibility of old leaking gas pipes in her bedroom, and he wore coveralls and had a toolbox. He tapped the walls and sniffed and murmured to himself in Italian, and then, when the two of them were surely alone, he began, still facing the wall, to speak softly in Middle Western American English. He said that he was from the War Department of the United States, which is what the Department of Defense used to be called. We had no separate spy organization back then. He said that he had no idea how she felt down deep about democracy or fascism, but that it was his duty to ask her, for the good of their country, to remain in Italy and to continue to curry the favor of Mussolini's government. By her own account, Marilee then thought about democracy and fascism for the first time in her life. She decided that democracy sounded better. "'Why should I stay here and do that?' she asked. "'Sooner or later you might hear something we would be very interested in knowing,' he said. "'Sooner or later, or even possibly never, your country might have some use to make of you.' She said to him that the whole world suddenly seemed to be going crazy. He commented that there was nothing sudden about it, that it had belonged in a prison or a lunatic asylum for quite some time. As an example of what she saw as sudden craziness, she told him about Mussolini's ordering his minister of culture to marry her. He replied, according to Marilee, If you have one atom of love for America in your heart, you will marry him. Thus did a coal miner's daughter become the Contessa Porta Maggiore. 30. Marilee did not learn until the war was nearly over that her husband was a British agent. She, too, thought him a weakling and a fool, but forgave him that, since they lived so well and he was so nice to her. He had the most amusing and kind and flattering things to say to me. He really enjoyed my company. We both loved to dance and dance. So there was another woman in my life with a mania for dancing, who would do it with anybody as long as they did it well. You never danced with Dan Gregory, I said. He wouldn't, she said, and you wouldn't either. I couldn't, I said. I never had. Anybody who wants to can, she said. She said that the news that her husband was a British spy made almost no impression on her. He had all these uniforms for different occasions, and I never cared what any of them were supposed to mean. They were covered with emblems which I never bothered to decode. I never asked him... Bruno, where did you, what did you get this medal for? What does the eagle on your sleeve mean? What are those two crosses on your collar points? So when he told me that he was a British spy, that was just more of the junk jewelry of warfare. It had almost nothing to do with me or him. She said that after he was shot, she expected to feel a terrible emptiness, but did not. And then she understood that her real companion and mate for life was the Italian people. They spoke to me so lovingly wherever I went, Rabo, and I loved them in return, and did not give a damn about what junk jewelry they wore. I'm home, Rabo, she said. I never would have got here if it hadn't been for the craziness of Dan Gregory. Thanks to loose screws in the head of an Armenian from Moscow, I'm home, I'm home. Now tell me what you've been doing with all these years, she said. For some reason, I find myself dismayingly uninteresting, I said. Oh, come, 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 she said. You lost an eye. You married. You reproduced twice. 
and you say you've taken up painting again. How could a life be more eventful? I thought to myself that there had been events, but very few, certainly, since our St. Patrick's Day lovemaking so long ago, which had made me proud and happy. I had old soldier's anecdotes I had told my drinking buddies in the Cedar Tavern, so I told her those. She had had a life. I had accumulated anecdotes. She was home. Home was somewhere I never thought I'd be. Old Soldier's Anecdote Number One While Paris was being liberated, I said, I went to find Pablo Picasso, Dan Gregory's idea of Satan, to make sure he was okay, I said. He opened his door a crack with a chain across it inside and said he was busy and did not wish to be disturbed. You could still hear guns going off only a couple blocks away. Then he shut and locked the door again. Marilee laughed and said, Maybe he knew all the terrible things our Lord and Master used to say about him. She said that if she had known I was still alive, she would have saved a picture in an Italian magazine which only she and I could fully appreciate. It showed a collage Picasso had made by cutting up a poster advertising American cigarettes. He had reassembled pieces of the poster, which originally showed three cowboys smoking around a campfire at night, to form a cat. Of all the art experts on earth, only Marilee and I, most likely, could identify the painter of the mutilated poster as Dan Gregory. How is that for trivia? So that is probably the only point at which Picasso paid the least bit attention to one of the most popular American artists in history, I speculated. Probably, she said. Old Soldier's Anecdote Number Three One evening in May, I said, we were marched out of our camp and into the countryside. We were halted at about three in the morning and told to sleep under the stars as best we could. When we awoke, when we awoke at sunrise, the guards were gone, and we found that we were on the rim of a valley near the ruins of an ancient stone watchtower. Below us, in that innocent farmland, were thousands upon thousands of people like us, who had been brought there by their, their guards, had been dumped. These weren't only prisoners of war. They were people who'd been marched out of concentration camps and factories where they'd been slaves, and out of regular prisons for criminals, and out of lunatic asylums. The idea was to turn us loose as far as possible from the cities where we might raise hell. And there were civilians there, too, who had run and run from the Russian front or from the American and British front. The fronts had actually met to the north and south of us. And there were hundreds in German uniforms, with their weapons still in working order, but docile now, waiting for whomever they were expected to surrender to. The peaceable kingdom, said Marilee. I changed the subject from war to peace. I told Marilee that I had returned to the arts after a long hiatus, and had, to my own astonishment, become a creator of serious paintings which would make Dan Gregory turn over in his hero's grave in Egypt, paintings such as the world had never seen before. She protested in mock horror. Oh, please, not the arts again, she said. They're a swamp I'll never get out of as long as I live. But she listened thoughtfully when I told her about our little gang in New York City, whose paintings were nothing alike except for one thing. They were about nothing but themselves. When I was all talked out, she sighed, and she shook her head. It was the last conceivable thing a painter could do to a canvas. So you did it, she said. Leave it to Americans to write the end. I hope that's not what we're doing, I said. I hope very much that it is what you're doing, she said. After all that men have done to the women and children and every other defenseless thing on this planet, it is time that not just every painting, but every piece of music, every statue, every play, every poem and book a man creates should say only this. We are much too horrible for this nice place. We give up. We quit. The end. She said that our unexpected reunion was a stro stroke of luck for her, since she thought I might have brought the solution to an interior decorating problem which had been nagging her for years. Namely, what sort of pictures, if any, should she put on the inane blanks between the columns of her rotunda? 
I want to leave some sort of mark on this place while I have it, she said, and the rotunda seems the place to do it. I considered hiring women and children to paint murals of the death camps and the bombing of Hiroshima and the planting of landmines and maybe the burning of witches and the feeding of Christians to wild animals in olden times, she said. But I think that sort of thing, on some level, just eggs men, men on to be even more destructive and cruel, makes them think, Ha! We're as powerful as gods. There has never been anything to stop us from doing even the most frightful things, if even the most frightful things are what we choose to do. So your idea is a much better one, Raybo. Let men come into my rotunda, and wherever they look at eye level, let them receive no encouragement. Let the walls cry out, The end! The end! Thus began the second great collection of American abstract expressionist art, the first being my own, the storage bills for which were making paupers of me and my wife and children. Nobody else wanted those pictures at any price. Marilee ordered ten of them sight unseen, to be selected by me, and at one thousand dollars each. You're joking, I said. The Countess Porta Maggiore never jokes, she said, and I'm as noble and rich as anybody who ever lived here, so you do what I say. So I did. She asked if our gang had come up with a name for ourselves, and we hadn't. It was critics who would finally name us. She said we should call ourselves the Genesis Gang, since we were going right back to the beginning, when subject matter had yet to be created. I found that a good idea, and would try to sell it on the others when I got home, but it never caught on somehow. Marilee and I talked for hours, until it was dark outside. She said at last, I think you'd better go now. Sounds like what you said to me on St. Patrick's Day fourteen years ago, I said. I hope you won't be so quick to forget me this time, she said. I never did that, she said. You forgot to worry about me, she said. I give you my word of honor, Contessa, I said, standing. I can never do that again. That was the last time we met. We exchanged several letters, though. I have dug one of hers from the archives here. It is dated three years after our reunion, June 7th, 1953, and says that we have failed to paint pictures of nothing after all, that she easily identifies chaos in every canvas. This is a pleasant joke, of course. Tell that to the rest of the Genesis gang, she says. I answered that letter with a cable, of which I have a copy. Not even chaos is supposed to be there, it reads. We'll come over and paint it out. Are Our Faces Red, St. Patrick. Bulletin from the present. Paul Slazinger has voluntarily committed himself to the psychiatric ward at the Veterans Administration Hospital over at Riverhead. I certainly didn't know what to do about the bad chemicals his body was dumping into his bloodstream, and he was becoming a maniac even to himself. Mrs. Berman was glad to see him out of here. Better he should be looked after by his Uncle Sam. 31. Of all the things I have to be ashamed of, the most troublesome of this old heart of mine is my failure as a husband of the good and brave Dorothy, and the consequent alienation of my own flesh and blood, Henri and Terry, from me, their dad. What will be found written after the name of Rabo Karabakian in the big book on Judgment Day? Soldier. Excellent. Husband and father. Flopperoo. Serious artist. Flopperoo. There was hell to pay when I got home from Florence. The good and brave Dorothy and both boys had a brand new kind of influenza, yet another post-war miracle. A doctor had been to see them and would come again, and a woman upstairs was feeding them. It was agreed that I could only be in the way until Dorothy got back to her feet, and that I should spend the next few nights at the studio Terry Kitchen and I had rented above Union Square. How smart we would have been to have me stay away for a hundred years instead. Before I go, I want to tell you I've got some really good news, I said. We're not going to move to that godforsaken house in the middle of nowhere, she said. That isn't it, I said. You and the kids will get to love it out there, with the ocean and lots of fresh air. Somebody's offered you a steady job out there, she said. No, I said. But you're going to look for one, she said. 
You're going to take your degree in business administration that we all sacrificed so much for and knock on doors out there till somebody in some decent business hires you so we'll have steady money coming in. Honey Bunch, listen to me, I said. When I was in Florence, I sold $10,000 worth of paintings. Our basement apartment resembled a storage room for scenery in a theater. There were so many huge canvases in there, which I had accepted in lieu of repayment of debts. So she got off this joke. Then you're going to end up in prison, she said, because we don't even have $3 worth of paintings here. I had made her so unhappy that she had developed a sense of humor, which she certainly didn't have when I married her. You're supposed to be 34 years old, she said. She herself was 23. I am 34, I said. Then act 34, she said. Act like a man with a wife and a family who'll be 40 before he knows it, and nobody will give him a job doing anything but sacking groceries or pumping gas. That's really laying it on the line, isn't it? I said. I don't lay it on the line like that, she said. Life lays it on the line like that, Raybo. What's happened to the man I married? We had such sensible plans for such a sensible life. And then you met these people, these bums. I always wanted to be an artist, I said. You never told me that, she said. I didn't think it was possible, I said. Now I do. Too late. "'and much too risky for a family man. "'Wake up,' she said. "'Why can't you just be happy with a nice family? "'Everybody else is.' "'I'll tell you again. "'I sold $10,000 worth of paintings in Florence,' I said. "'That'll fall through like everything else,' she said. "'If you love me, you'd have more faith in me as a painter,' I said. "'I love you, but I hate your friends and your paintings,' she said. "'And I'm scared for me and my babies.' the way things are going. The war is over, Raybo. What is that supposed to mean, I said. You don't have to do wild things, great big things, dangerous things that don't have a chance, she said. You've already got all the medals anybody could want. You don't have to conquer France. This last reference was our grandiose talk about making New York City rather than Paris the art capital of the world. They were on our side anyway, weren't they, she said. Why do you have to go conquer them? What did they ever do to you? I was already outside the apartment when she asked me that, so all she had to do the end, to end the conversation was what Picasso had done to me, which was to close the door and lock it. I could hear her crying inside. Poor soul. Poor soul. It was late afternoon. I took my suitcase over to Kitchen's in my studio. Kitchen was asleep on his cot. Before I woke him up, I had a look at what had been what he had been doing in my absence. He had slashed all of his paintings with an ivory-handled straight razor inherited from his paternal grandfather, who had been president of the New York Central Railroad. The art world certainly wasn't any the poorer for what he had done. I had the obvious thought. It's a miracle he didn't slash his wrists as well. This was a great, big, beautiful Anglo-Saxon sleeping there, like Fred Jones, a model for a Dan Gregory illustration of a story about an ideal American hero. And when he and I went places together, we really did look like Jones and Gregory. Not only that, but Kitchen treated me as respectfully as Fred had treated Gregory, which was preposterous. Fred had been a genuine, dumb, sweet lunk, whereas my own buddy, sleeping there, was a graduate of Yale Law School could have been a professional pianist, or tennis player, or golfer. He had inherited a world of talent along with that straight razor. His father was a first-rate cellist, cellist, and chess player, and horticulturist, as well as a corporation lawyer and a pioneer in winning civil rights for the black people. My sleeping buddy also outranked me in the army, as lieutenant colonel in the paratroops, and in deeds of daring do. But he chose to stand in awe of me because I could do one thing he could never do, which was to draw or paint a likeness of anything my eye could see. As for my own work there in the studio, the big fields of color before which I could stand intoxicated for hour after hour, they were meant to be beginnings. I expected them to become more and more complicated as I slowly but surely closed in on what had so long eluded me. Soul. 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 
I woke him up and said that I would buy him an early supper at the Cedar Tavern. I didn't tell him about the big deal I had pulled off in Florence, since he couldn't be a part of it. He wouldn't get his hands on the spray rig for two more days. When the Contessa Porta Maggiore died, incidentally, her collection would include 16 Terry Kitchens. Early supper meant early drinking, too. There were already three painters at what had become our regular table in the back. I will call them Painters X, Y, and Z. And lest I give aid and comfort to Philistines eager to hear that the first abstract expressionists were a bunch of drunks and wild men, let me say who these three weren't. They were not, repeat, were not, William Baziotes, James Brooks, Willem de Kooning, Achille Gorky, who was already dead by then anyway, Adolf Gottlieb, Philip Guston, Hans Hoffman, Barnett Newman, Jackson Pollock, Ad Reinhardt, Mark Rothko, Clifford Still, Sid Solomon, or Bradley Walker Tomlin. Pollock would show up that evening all right, but he was on the wagon. He would not say a word and would soon go home again. And one person there wasn't a painter at all, as far as we knew. He was a tailor. His name was Isidore Finkelstein, and his shop was right above the tavern. After a couple of drinks, he could talk painting as well as anyone. His grandfather, he said, had been a tailor in Vienna and had made several suits for the painter Gustav Klimt before the First World War. And we got on the subject of why, even though we had given shows which had excited some critics and which had inspired a big story in Life magazine about Pollock, we still weren't making anywhere near enough to live on. We concluded that it was our clothing and grooming which were holding us back. This was a kind of joke. Everything we said was a kind of joke. I still don't understand how things got so gruesomely serious for Pollock and Kitchen after only six more years went by. Slazinger was there, too. That was where I met him. He was gathering material for a novel about painters, one of a dozen of novels he never wrote. At the end of that evening, I remember, he said to me, I can't get over how passionate you guys are, and yet so absolutely unserious. Everything about life is a joke, I said. Don't you know that? No, he said. Finkelstein declared himself eager to solve the clothing problem of anyone who thought he had one. He would do it for a small down payment and a manageable installment plan. So the next thing I knew, painters X, Y, and Z, and I, and Kitchen were all upstairs in Finkelstein's shop, getting measured for suits. Pollock and Slazinger had came along, but only as spectators. Nobody else had any money, so, in character, I made everybody's down payment with the traveler's checks I had left over from my trip to Florence. Painters X, Y, and Z, incidentally, would pay me back with pictures the very next afternoon. Painter X had a key to our apartment, which I had given him after he was thrown out of his flea bag motel for setting his bed on fire. So he and the other two delivered their paintings and got out again before poor Dorothy could defend herself. Finkelstein, the tailor, had been a real killer in the war, and so had Kitchen been. I never was. Finkelstein was a tank gunner in Patton's Third Army. When he measured me for my suit, a suit I still own, he told me, his mouth full of pins, about how a track was blown off his tank by a boy with a rocket launcher two days before the war in Europe ended. So they shot him before they realized he was just a boy. And here is a surprise. When Finkelstein died of a stroke three years later, when we were all starting to do quite well financially, it turned out that he had been a secret painter all along. His young widow, Rachel, who looked a lot like Sears Berman, now that I think about it, gave him a one-man show in his shop before it closed up forever. His stuff was unambitious, but strong, as, represent as representational as he could make it, much like what his fellow war heroes Winston Churchill and Dwight David Eisenhower used to do. Like them, he enjoyed paint. Like them, he appreciated reality. That was the late painter, Isidore Finkelstein. After we had been measured for suits, we went back down to the tavern for more food and drink and talk, talk, talk. We were joined by a seemingly rich, distinguished gentleman, about 60 years old. I had never seen him before, and neither had any of the others, as nearly as I could tell. I hear you are painters, he said. Do you mind if I just sit here and listen in? He was between me and Pollock and across the table from Kitchen. 
Most of us are painters, I said. We weren't about to be rude to him. It was possible that he was an art collector, or maybe on the board of directors of an important museum. We knew what all the critics and dealers looked like. He was much too honest, obviously, to take part in either of those scruffy trades. Most of you are painters, he echoed. Aha! So the simplest thing would be for you to tell me who isn't one. Finkelstein and Slazenger so identified themselves. Oh, I guessed wrong, he said. He indicated kitchen. I wouldn't have thought he was a painter either, he said. Despite his rough clothes, a musician maybe, or a lawyer, or a professional athlete maybe. A painter? He sure fooled me. He had to be a clairvoyant, I thought, to home in on the truth about Kitchen with such accuracy. Yes, and he kept his attention locked on Kitchen, as though he were reading his mind. Why would he be more fascinated by somebody who had yet to paint a single interesting picture than by Pollock, whose work was causing such controversy, and who was sitting right next to him? He asked Kitchen if he had by any chance seen service in the war. Kitchen said that he had, he did not elaborate. Did that have something to do with your decision to be a painter? said the old man. No, said Kitchen. Slazenger would say to me later that he thought that the war had embarrassed Kitchen about how privileged he had always been, easily mastering the piano, easily getting through the best schools, easily beating most people at almost any game, easily getting to be a lieutenant colonel in no time at all, and so on. To teach himself something about real life, said Slazenger, he picked one of the few fields where he could not help being a hopeless bungler. Kitchen said as much to his questioner. Painting is my Mount Everest, he said. Mount Everest hadn't been climbed yet. That wouldn't happen until 1953, the same year Finkelstein would be buried and have his one-man show. The old gentleman sat back, seemingly much pleased by this answer. But then he got much too personal, in my opinion, asking Kitchen if he was independently wealthy or if his family was supporting him while he made such an arduous climb. I knew that Kitchen would become a very rich man if he outlived his mother and father, and that his parents had refused to give him any money in the hopes of forcing him to start practicing law or enter politics or take a job on Wall Street, where success was assured. I didn't think that that was any of the old gentleman's business, and I wanted Kitchen to tell him so. But Kitchen told him all, and when he was done answering, his expression indicated that he was ready for another question, no matter what it might be. This was the next one. You are married, of course. No, said Kitchen. But you like women, said the old gentleman. He was putting that question to a man who, before the end of the war, was one of the planet's greatest coxmen. At this point in my life, sir, said Kitchen, I am a waste of time for women, and women are a waste of time for me. The old man stood. I thank you for being so frank and polite with me, he said. I try, said Kitchen. The old gentleman departed. We made guesses as to who and what he might have been. Finkelstein said, I remember, that whoever he was, his clothes had come from England. I said I was going to have to borrow or rent a car the next day, to get the house out here ready for my family. I also wanted to have a look, another look at the potato barn I'd rented. Kitchen asked if he could come along, and I said, sure. And then there was this spray rig waiting for him in Montauk. Talk about fate! Before we dropped off to sleep on our cots that night, I asked him if he had the least idea who the old gentleman who had questioned him so closely could have been. "'I'll make a really wild guess,' he said. "'What is it?' I said. "'I, I could be wrong. "'But I think that was my father,' he said. "'Looked like Dad. "'Sounded like Dad. "'Dressed like Dad. "'Made wry jokes like Dad. "'I watched him like a hawk, Raybo, "'and I said to myself, Either this is a very clever imitator, or this is the man who fathered me. You're smart, and you're my best and only friend. Tell me, if he was simply a good imitator of my father, what could his game have been? 32. I wound up renting a truck instead of a car for Kitchens and I and my fateful foray out here. 
Talk about fate. If I hadn't rented a truck, Kitchen might be practicing law now, since there is no way we could have fit the spray rig into a closed sedan, which is the kind of car I would have rented. Every so often, but not often enough, God knows, I would think of something which would make my wife and family a little less unhappy, and the truck was a case in point. The least I could do was get all the canvases out of our apartment, since they made poor Dorothy feel sick as a dog, even when she was well. "'You're not going to put them in the new house, are you?' she said. "'That is what I had intended to do. "'I have never been famous for thinking ahead. "'But I said, no. "'I formulated a new scheme, which was to put them in the potato barn, "'but I didn't say so. "'I hadn't had the nerve to tell her I had rented a potato barn. "'But she'd found out about it some way. "'She would find out some way, too, that I had bought myself and painters X, Y, and Z, and Kitchen,' tailor-made suits of the finest materials and workmanship the night before. "'Put them in the potato barn,' she said, "'and bury them under potatoes, potatoes we can always use.' "'That truck should have been an armored car in a convoy of state police, "'considering what some of the paintings in there are worth today. "'I myself considered them valuable, but certainly not that valuable, "'so I could not bring myself to put them in the barn.' which was then a musty place, having been home for so long for nothing but potatoes and the earth and bacteria and fungi which so loved to cling to them. So I rented a dry, clean space under lock and key at Home Sweet Home Moving and Storage out here instead. The rental over the years would absorb a major part of my income. Nor did I overcome my habit of helping painter pals in trouble with whatever cash I had or could lay my hands on and accepting pictures in return. At least Dorothy did not have to look at the detritus of this habit. Every painting which settled a debt in full went straight from the needy painter's studio to home sweet home. Her parting words to Kitchen and me when we, were, when we at last got the pictures out of the apartment were these. One thing I like about the Hamptons, every so often you see a sign that says, Town Dump. If Kitchen had been a perfect Fred Jones to my Dan Gregory... He would have driven the truck, but he was very much the passenger, and I was the chauffeur. He had grown up with chauffeurs, so he didn't think twice when he got in on the passenger side. I talked about my marriage and the war and the Great Depression, and about how much older Kitchen and I both were, compared with the typical returning veteran. I should have started a family and settled down years ago, I said. But how could I have done that when I was the right age to do it? What women did I know anyway? All the returning veterans in the movies are our age or older, he said. That was true. In the movies, you seldom saw baby, the babies who had done most of the heavy fighting in the, on the ground in the war. Yes, I said, and most of the actors in the movies never even went to war. They came home to the wife and kids in swimming pool ev after every grueling day in front of the cameras, after firing off blank cartridges while men all around them were spitting ketchup. Well, that's what the young people will think our war was fifty years from now, said Kitchen. Old men and blanks and ketchup. So they would. So they do. Because of the movies, he predicted, nobody will believe that it was babies who fought the war. Three years out of our lives, he said, about the war. You keep forgetting I was a regular, I said. It was eight years out of mine. And there went my youth, and God, I still want it. Poor Dorothy thought she was marrying a mature, fatherly, retired military gentleman. What she got instead was an impossibly self-centered and undisciplined jerk of nineteen or so. I can't help it, I said. My soul knows my meat is doing bad things and is embarrassed. But my meat just keeps on doing bad, dumb things. You're what and you're what, he said. My soul and my meat, I said. They're separate, he said. I sure hope they are, I said. I laughed. I would hate to be responsible for what my meat does. I told him, only half joking, about how I imagined the soul of each person, myself included, as being a sort of flexible neon tube inside. All the tube could do was receive news about what was happening with the meat, over which it had no control. So when people like I like do something terrible, I said, I just flens them and forgive them. Flens, he said. 
What's flens? It's what whalers used to do to whale carcasses when they got them on board, I said. They would strip off the skin and blubber and meat right down to the skeleton. I do that in my head to people. Get rid of all the meat so I can see nothing but their souls. Then I forgive them. Where would you ever come across a word like flens, he said. And I said, in an edition of Moby Dick, illustrated by Dan Gregory. He talked about his father, who was still alive, by the way, and who has just celebrated his hundredth birthday. Think of that. He adored his father. He also said that he would never want to compete with him, to try to beat him at anything. I would hate that, he said. Hate what, I said. To beat him, he said. He said that the poet Conrad Aiken had lectured at Yale when Kitchen was in law school there, and had said that sons of gifted men went into fields occupied by their fathers, but where their fathers were weak. Aiken's own father had been a great physician and politician and ladies' man, but had also fancied himself a poet. His poetry was no damn good, so Aiken became a poet, said Kitchen. I could never do such a thing to my old man. What he would do to his father six years later in the front yard of Kitchen's shack about six miles from here was take a shot at him with a pistol. Kitchen was drunk then, as he often was, and his father had come for the umpteenth time to beg him to get treatment for his alcoholism. It can never be proved, but that shot had to have been intended as a gesture. When Kitchen saw that he had actually gunned down his father with a bullet in the shoulder, it turned out nothing would do but that Kitchen put the pistol barrel in his own mouth and kill himself. It was an accident. It was on that fateful truck trip, too, that I got my first look at Edith Taft Fairbanks, who would be my second wife. I had negotiated the rental of the barn from her husband, who was an affable idler, who seemed a useless, harmless waster of life to me back then, but who would become the, sol the role model I kept in mind when he died and I became her husband. Prophetically, she was carrying a, ta a tamed raccoon in her arms. She was a magical tamer of almost any sort of animal, an overwhelmingly loving and uncritical nurturer of anything and everything that looked half alive. That's what she would do to me when I was living at, as a hermit in the barn and she needed a new husband. She tamed me with nature poems and good things to eat, which she left outside my sliding doors. I'm sure she tamed her first husband, too, and thought of him lovingly and patronizingly as some kind of dumb animal. She never said what kind of animal she thought he was. I know what kind of animal she thought I was because she came right out and said it to a female relative from Cincinnati at our wedding reception, when I was all dressed up in my Izzy Fink Finkelstein suit. I want you to meet my tamed raccoon. I will be buried in that suit, too. It says so in my will. I am to be buried next to my wife Edith in Green River Cemetery, in the dark blue suit whose label says, Made to Order for Rabo Karabakian by Isidore Finkelstein. It wears and wears. Well, the execution of that will still lies in the future, but just about everything else has vanished into the past, including Sears Berman. She finished up her book and returned to Baltimore two weeks ago. On her last night here, she wanted me to take her dancing, and I again refused. I took her to supper at the American Hotel in Sag Harbor instead. Just another tourist trap nowadays, Sag Harbor, Sag Harbor used to be a whaling port. You can still see the mansions of the brave captains who sailed from there to the Pacific Ocean around the tip of South America, and then came home millionaires. In the lobby of the hotel is a guest register, open to a date at the peak of the whale-killing industry, so disreputable nowadays. March 1st, 1849. Back then, Circe's ancestors were in the Russian Empire and mine in the Turkish Empire, which would have made them enemies. We feasted on lobsters and drank in moderation in order to become voluble. It is a bad thing to need a drink, everybody is saying now. And I, in fact, went without alcohol the whole time I was a hermit. But my feelings about Mrs. Berman on the eve of her departure were so contradictory that, without a drink, I might have eaten in wooden silence. But I certainly wasn't going to drive with a couple of drinks in me, and neither was she. It used to be almost fashionable to drive when drunk, 
but no more, no more. So I hired a boyfriend of Celeste's to drive us over there in her in his father's car, and then pick us up again. In the simplest terms, I was sorry that she was leaving, because she was exciting to have around, but she could also be too exciting, telling everybody exactly what to do. So I was also glad that she was going, since what I wanted most, with my own book so nearly finished, was peace and quiet for a change. To put it another way, we were acquaintances, despite our months together. We had not become great friends. That would change, however, once I had shown her what was in the, tib- the potato barn. Yes, that's right. This determined widow from Baltimore, before she left, persuaded this old Armenian geezer to unlock the locks and turn on the floodlights in the potato barn. What did I get in exchange? I think we're really friends now. 33. When we got home from the American hotel, the first thing she said was, One thing you don't have to worry about, I'm not going to badger you about the keys to the potato barn. Thank God, I said. I think she was certain right then that before the night was over, one way or another, she was damn well going to see what was in the potato barn. I only want you to draw me a picture, she said. Do what, I said. You're a very modest man, she said, to the point where anybody who believed you would think you were no good at anything. Except camouflage, I said. You're forgetting camouflage. I was awarded a presidential unit citation. My platoon was so good at camouflage. Okay, camouflage, she said. We were so good at camouflage, I said, that half the things we hid from the enemy have to this very day never been seen again. And that's not true, she said. We're having a celebration, so all sorts of things have been said which are not true, I said. That's how to act at a party. You want me to go home to Baltimore knowing a whole lot of things about you which are not true, she said. Everything that's true about me you should have learned before now, given your profound powers of investigation, I said. This is just a party. I still don't know whether you can really draw or not, she said. Don't worry about it, I said. That's the bedrock of your life, to hear you tell it, she said. That and camouflage. You were no good as a commercial artist, and you were no good as a serious artist, and you were no good as a husband or a father, and your great collection of paintings is an accident. But you keep coming back to one thing you're proud of. You could really draw. It's true, I said. I didn't realize that, but now that you mention it, it's true. So prove it, she said. It's a very small boast, I said. I wasn't an Albrecht Dürer. I could draw better than you or Slazenger or the cook or Pollock or Terry Kitchen. I was born with this gift, which certainly doesn't look like much when you compare me with all of the far superior draftsmen who've lived and died. I wowed the grade school and then the high school in San Ignacio, California. If I'd lived 10,000 years ago, I might have wowed the cave dwellers in Lascaux, France whose standards for draftsmanship must have been on about the same level as of those in San Ignacio. If your book is actually published, she said, you're going to have to include at least one picture that proves you can draw. Readers will insist on that. Poor souls, I said. And the worst thing about getting as old as I am, you're not that old, she said. Old enough, I said. And the worst thing is that you keep finding yourself in the middle of the same old conversations, no matter who you're talking to. Slazenger didn't think I could draw. My first wife didn't think I could draw. My second wife didn't care whether I could or not. I was just an old raccoon she brought in from the barn and turned into a house pet. She loved animals whether they could draw or not. What did you say to your first wife when she bet you couldn't draw, she said. We had just moved out in the country, where she didn't know a soul, I said. There still wasn't heat in the house, and I was trying to keep us warm with fires in the three fireplaces, like my pioneer ancestors. And Dorothy was finally catch- was finally trying to catch up on art, reading up on it, since she had resigned herself to being stuck with an artist. She had never seen me draw, because not drawing and forgetting everything I knew about art, I thought, was the magic key to my becoming a serious painter. So, 
sitting in front of a fire in the kitchen fireplace with all the heat going up the flue instead of coming out in the room, I said. Dorothy read in an art magazine that what an Italian sculptor had said about the first abstract expressionist paintings ever to be shown in a major show in Europe at the Venice Biennale in 1950, the same year I had my reunion with Marilee. "'You had a painting there?' said Sears. "'No,' I said. "'It was just Gorky and Pollock and de Kooning. "'And this Italian sculptor, who was supposedly very important back then, "'but who is all but forgotten now, "'said this about what we thought we were up to. "'These Americans are very interesting. "'They dive into the water before they learn to swim. "'He meant we couldn't draw. "'Dorothy picked up on that right away.' She wanted to hurt me as much as I had hurt her, so she said, So that's it. You guys all paint the way you do because you couldn't paint something real if you had to. I didn't rebut her with words. I snatched a green crayon Dorothy had been using to make a list of all the things inside and outside the house that she had to be, that had to be repaired, and I drew portraits on the kitchen wall of our two, of our two boys who were asleep in front of the fireplace in the living room. I just did their heads, life-size. I didn't even go into the living room to look at them first. The wall was new sheetrock, which I had nailed over the cracked plaster. I hadn't gotten around to filing and taping the joints between the sheets yet and covering the nail heads. I never would. Dorothy was flabbergasted, I said to Sears. She said to me, Why don't you do that all the time? And I said to her, and this was the first time I ever said fuck to her, no matter how angry we might have been with each other. It's just too fucking easy. You never did fill in the joints between the sheetrock, said Mrs. Berman. That is certainly a woman's question, I said, and my, man's, my manly answer is this one. No, I did not. So what happened to the portraits, she said. Were they painted over? No, I said. They stayed there on the sheetrock for six years, but then I came home half drunk one afternoon and found my wife and children in the pi and the pictures gone, and a note from Dorothy saying they were gone forever. She had cut the pictures out of the sheetrock and taken them with her. They were two big square holes where the pictures used to be. You must have felt awful, said Mrs. Berman. Yes, I said. Pollock and Kitchen had killed themselves only a few weeks before that and my own paintings were falling apart. So when I saw those two squares cut out of the sheetrock in that empty house, I stopped. Never mind, I said. Finish the sentence, Raybo, she begged. That was as close as I'll ever be, I said, to feeling what my father must have felt when he was a young teacher and found himself all alone in his village after the massacre. Slazinger was another one who had never seen me draw, who wondered if I could really draw. I had been living out here for a couple of years by then, and he came by to watch me paint in the potato barn. I had set up a stretched and primed canvas eight feet by eight feet, and was about to lay on a coat of sateen duralux with a roller. He was a shade of greenish burnt it was a shade of greenish burnt orange called Hungarian Rhapsody. Little did I know that Dorothy, back at the house, was slathering our whole bedroom with Hungarian Rhapsody. But that is another story. Tell me, Raybo, said Slazinger, if I put on that same paint with that same roller, would the picture still be a Carabakian? Absolutely, I said, provided you have in reserve what Carabakian has in reserve. Like what, he said. Like this, I said. There was dust in a pothole in the floor and I picked up some of it on the balls of both my thumbs. Working both thumbs simultaneously, I sketched a caricature of Slazinger's face on the canvas in 30 seconds. Jesus, he said. I had no idea you could draw like that. You're looking at a man who has options, I said. And he said, I guess you do. I guess you do. I covered up that caricature with a couple of coats of Hungarian Rhapsody and laid on tapes which were supposed to be pure abstraction, but which to me were secretly six deer in a forest glade. The deer were near the left edge. On the right was a red vertical band, which to me, again secretly, was the soul of a hunter drawing a bead on one of them. I called it Hungarian Rhapsody No. 6, which was bought by the Guggenheim Museum. 
That picture was in storage when it started to fall apart like all the rest of them. A woman curator just happened to walk by and see all this tape and flakes of sateen Duralux on the floor, so she called me up to ask what could be done to restore the picture, and whether they might be at fault some way. I didn't know where she had been the past year, when my pictures had become notorious for falling apart everywhere. She honestly thought maybe the Guggenheim hadn't provided proper humidity controls or whatever. I was at that time living like an animal in the potato barn, friendless and unloved, but I did have a telephone. One very strange thing, she went on, this big face has emerged from the canvas. It was the caricature, of course, which I had drawn with filthy thumbs. You should notify the Pope, I said. The Pope, he, she said? Yes, I said. You may have the next best thing to the Shroud of Turin. I had better explain to young readers that the Shroud of Turin is a linen sheet in which a dead person has been wrapped, which bears the imprint of an adult male who has been crucified, which the best scientists of today agree may indeed be 2,000 years old. It is widely believed to have swaddled none other than Jesus Christ, and is the chief treasure of the Cathedral of San Giovanni Battista in Turin, Italy. My joke with the lady at the Guggenheim suggested that it might be the face of Jesus emerging from the canvas, possibly just in time to prevent World War III. But she, but she topped my joke. She said, Well, I would call the Pope right away, except for one thing. What's that? I said. And she said, you happen to be talking to somebody who used to date Paul Slazinger. I made her the same offer I had made everybody else, that I would duplicate the painting exactly in more durable materials, paints, and tapes, which really would outlive the smile on Mona Lisa. But the Guggenheim, like everybody else, turned me down. Nobody wanted to spoil the hilarious footnote I had become in art history. With a little luck, my last name might actually find its way into dictionaries. Karabakian. Karabakian. Noun. From Rebo Karabakian, U.S. 20th century painter. Fiasco, in which a person causes total destruction of own work and reputation through stupidity, carelessness, or both. <laughs>